All right, so thank you all for coming. It's the hour, so I'm gonna get started. I'm super excited about this session. Um, I wanna make a note in the beginning as my media team is messaging me to make this note. If you are a member of the media and you have any questions while this presentation is going on, please feel free to DM Jenny Mohan, that's J-A-N-A-N-I. She's going to be our press contact for this event today. So hello all and welcome to this week's Dweeb Live, Dweeb's Live presentation. We have a truly wonderful session in store for you. I am Ishri Maranwe, the president of Dweeb's Global and your host today. So Dweeb's Global is a COVID-19 response organization. Today's session is about the virus, so it's very apt and timely. For those of you who haven't heard of us yet, we provide free mentorship to anyone who needs it, from free resume edits and career advice to mental health help. We're focused on helping people through their health and economic struggles during this pandemic. We were only founded in April, but since then have grown to over 400 mentors around the world, providing life-changing services to mentees across the globe. So if you need any advice or mentorship from a resume or cover letter edit to speaking to a nutritionist, please just send us a contact at www.dweebsglobal.org slash contact. We'll pop that in Zoom and we will pair you with a mentor who will help you for free. So today we have Dr. Kyle Malhotra with us to talk about treatments and therapeutics for COVID. His stellar background is super valued. Dr. Malhotra is a clinical pharmacist at Intermountain Medical Center in Utah. His work has brought him to the front lines of COVID-19 with his practice area focusing on internal medicine and public health. Of course, this year there really are no more important people than our frontline workers. So I'm deeply grateful for your time and for what you do every day. Uh, Dr. Malhotra received his doctorate from the University of Arizona College of Pharmacy and it is truly, truly a privilege to have you here. So if you have any questions during Dr. Malhotra's presentation, please send them via Zoom chat to me. You can post it publicly or you can DM me. We'll ask questions at the end and we will have a robust off the record question and answer section. If you are a member of the media and you have a media question, also please free to DM me or Jenny. We'll start the uh, question section with some on the record questions if you have any. So please let us know. And without further ado, I will turn it over to Dr. Malhotra. Welcome. Hey there, how are you doing today? <laughs> um, so I appreciate that uh, very kind introduction. Um, my name is Kyle, as uh, I was previously introduced. So let's get off, let's, uh, let's get started. Um, first of all, I'd like to acknowledge two of my colleagues, Drs. Rachel Foster and Drs. Nick Tinker. Both of them are clinical pharmacists who work with me. Uh, their specialty is infectious disease, and they were kind enough to devote some of their um, valuable time to uh, reviewing this presentation and making sure that everything was up to date. Um, I have nothing to disclose. Um, I will be talking about some off-label uses of, uh, of the following drugs, including dexamethasone uh, and tocilizumab. Um, I'll also be talking about the SARS-CoV-2 spike protein monoclonal antibody treatments, which are currently not approved by the FDA as of yet. So let's start off with a few definitions. First is SARS-CoV-2. It's a new virus that's actually a member of the coronavirus family and it's known to infect humans. COVID-19, although it is used interchangeably with the SARS-CoV-2 um, virus is actually a syndrome caused by the infection from the virus itself. And this syndrome can include things like respiratory distress, uh, kidney dysfunction or GI distress. Um, a few um, other things to note is also to, um, to define pneumonia, which is an infection of the lungs caused by a virus or bacteria. A few other definitions we should go over is uh, low flow oxygen support, which is essentially anything less than six liters of oxygen delivered to the patient generally by nasal cannula. Anything greater than that is considered, is considered high flow oxygen support. And this usually involves stepping above a nasal cannula and using either a mask or something else called a non-rebreather, which can go up to 15 liters of oxygen delivered to the patient. Mechanical ventilation is when you use a machine to assist with the patient's breathing. So this involves inserting a tube into the patient's throat and into their lungs, and then using a machine to help breathe for the patient. And the last one we need to talk about is something called ECMO, or extracorporeal membrane oxygenation. This actually involves putting a cannula into the patient's um, circulatory system, taking the blood, rooting it through a machine to oxygenate it, and then pumping it back into the patient. The other thing we should discuss are survival curves. We're going to be bringing a few of these into our, into our presentation today to discuss some of the outcomes of these studies. These two are essentially the same. 
So what I want you to do is when you look at the left one, take a look at the y-axis, it says mortality. So at the beginning of the study or day since, since randomization being zero, all the patients on all the subjects are alive. And as you progress through the disease, you can start to see that some of the patients begin to pass away. And one curve will, in this case, represent usual care or placebo if a patient is receiving a placebo match with the main drug. And the other one will be the treatment or the intervention arm, which at least in this case is dexamethasone, which is actually one of the drugs we'll be talking about later on in this presentation. So as you progress through, mortality increases, and that's why the curves start to go up. Now take a look at where it says rate ratio. If you start to look towards the right, you'll see 0 0.83, which is the ratio, and then 95% CI, that stands for confidence interval. Now in ratio world, if it crosses one, that means the numerator is the same as the denominator, which means that there is no difference between the groups. In this case, it does not cross one, so you can say that it is statistically significant. Another way to look at that is to look at the p-value beneath that. If it is less than 0 0.05, that means it is statistically significant. In this case, 0 0.001. Now let's take a look at the, next comp at the next survival curve. This one is pretty much the same exact thing, except it's kind of flipped. In this case, all patients or all subjects are alive at the beginning of the study, so it actually says 100%. And as time goes along, the curves start to drop as subjects begin to pass away. Once again, the confidence interval on the right-hand side of the screen does not cross one, so you could say that it is statistically significant, similar to the left-hand graph, and the p-value is also less than 0 0.05. I also thought I should bring this into, uh, into our discussion. This is what we call levels of evidence. Now, if you take a look at the top, you can say clinical practice guidelines. Those are large guidelines produced by um, societies to help guide physicians in their treatment of patients. If you take a look below that where it says randomized control trials or prospective and test treatments, these are experimental studies. And this is our highest level of evidence. These are the gold standards which help guide us in our treatment of patients. Now we don't always have these nice randomized control trials and we'll discuss some of those later on, but these are the ones that we try to go towards. And if we have those, those are considered the gold standard when it comes to, to experimenting, um, to testing the, ex the experimental treatments and determining whether or not they actually have positive outcomes on our subjects or our patients. Beneath that are cohort studies followed by case control studies. These are really nice to sort of proposing a hypothesis but are not so much in the way of changing treatment. Believe that you have sort of lower levels of evidence, which is case control studies and then case reports and then animal and laboratory studies. Those ones generally do not in involve humans. Anatomy of the SARS-CoV-2 virus. It actually gets its name coronavirus because it looks kind of like a crown. If you kind of look down at this viron, you can see that it looks like a crown. The little spikes um, are the spike proteins are shaped like clovers and they actually bind the ACE2 enzyme on your lung cells. And that's how they actually gain entry into the cells itself and then cause infection. So that's actually kind of what I want, to, want you to focus on is that those spike proteins. The other thing I want you to look at is the nucleocapsid protein or that little squiggly spaghetti looking thing in the center. Those, that's actually the DNA or the RNA within the virus itself that codes um, a couple of different things. First is how the virus is made. And actually second is the machinery required to hijack your cells um, into creating new virons. Those spike proteins are what, let, what let it, lets it gain access to the cells. And then that RNA is what encodes the, uh, the machinery to reproduce. Let's talk a little bit about the treatment options that we're gonna be discussing during this presentation. We're gonna be talking about dexamethasone, which is a steroid, remdesivir, which is actually a decoy, not really a decoy, but a fake nucleotide that will interfere with the viral replication. Next is tocilizumab, which is a monoclonal antibody designed to block interleukin-6, which is something we'll discuss later on. It's one of your body's cell signals that tells it to kickstart the inf inflammatory process and start revving up the immune system. Regen-CoV-2, which is a combination of two different antibodies, which target that spike protein that we just discussed. And last but not least, hydroxychloroquine. Dexamethasone is the first one we're going to discuss. As you can see, the gentleman on the left has pneumonia. Pneumonia is when the is an infection of the lungs, which then causes the lungs to become inflamed. In this case, 
the virus is in gaining access to the lungs, infects the lungs, and then the body starts to have an immune response. The lung sacs will start to fill with fluid, which makes it difficult to breathe. Dexamethasone actually tamps down the immune response. What this causes is that the immune response actually starts to kickstart, lungs start to get inflamed, makes it difficult to breathe, and that can actually be harmful or detrimental. So one of the prevailing hypotheses is that the virus harms you by causing an overimmune response or too much of a good thing is a bad thing and that your immune response is doing is killing off the virus but then in your organs sort of get caught in the crossfire so dexamethasone kind of turns down the volume and causes the immune response to back off a little bit which then allows the patient time to recover so the study that we actually looked at, whether or not dexamethasone actually works, it's called the recovery study. This is one of the landmark trials. And what they did is they included any patient who has a known or suspected infection with SARS-CoV-2. To figure this out, they would use a PCR or one of those brain swabs that you probably heard about, or more recently, saliva. What they did is they gave the patient dexamethasone six milligrams on the first day, and then six milligrams, um, sorry, six milligrams a day for 10 days. And they compared it against patients who were getting usual care, which generally includes supportive therapy, which is things like fluids, oxygen support, and inhalers if, if required. And now we're going to bring out our first survival curve. So over here on the left hand, on the y-axis, you can see mortality. On the x-axis is day since randomization. And what we found is actually pretty cool. Patients receiving dexamethasone had a lower risk of dying at 28 days. So this is great. Maybe we should give it to every single patient that walks through the door with, with uh, COVID. Not so fast. Let's break it down a little bit further. On the left-hand graph, you can see at the very top, it says invasive mechanical ventilation. So this is what we talked about earlier, where you put a tube into the patient's throat and into their lungs to help them breathe. And the one on the right is oxygen only. So this is delivered through a nasal cannula. And what we found is that patients who were on a ventilator or who were getting supplemental oxygen did better. You can see that confidence interval on both of them. On the left-hand one, it says 0.51 to 0.81. And on the right one, it says 0.72 to 0.94. They did not cross one. So that means it was statistically significant and these patients did get a mortality benefit. But here's the next question. What if they didn't require ventilation or supplemental oxygen? And what we found is there was no benefit. That confidence interval goes from 0 0.91 to 1.55. So what we found is that dexamethasone should be, showed benefit and should be considered for patients who require supplemental oxygen or mechanical ventilation. And anybody else who doesn't meet that criteria um, should, should not receive this medication. The next one is remdesivir. This is actually converted into a compound or a nucleotide, which resembles that of one of the things that the virus needs to replicate. So you give the patient remdesivir, it gets incorporated into the RNA within the remdesivir, but because it's not a real nucleotide, it blocks the replication of the virus. Kind of makes sense. You, you, it's basically like if you were to um, have somebody who's making a blueprint to a house, but then you give them paper that's just gonna fall apart. After a while, you don't have the blueprints anymore. So you can't make a house. Same thing with the virus. So this is the ACT trial, which is another one of the landmark trials. And what we did is we also included patients with a known or suspected infection with the SARS-CoV-2 virus. Unlike the previous one where they pretty much allowed anybody to come in, this one they excluded if you're pregnant, breastfeeding, or less than 18 years of age. On day one, you get 200 milligrams of remdesivir, and then 100 milligrams thereafter for up to 10 days. And in this one is, is the more of the gold standard was placebo controlled. So patients would get a matching bag, usually of normal saline. They had two groups, remdesivir and placebo. Their primary outcome was defined as improvement in clinical status at day 14. And we'll be talking about clinical status in the next, in the next slide. Secondary outcomes include mortality, duration of oxygen use, hospitalization, high flow oxygen or ventilation, and then last but not least, duration of mechanical ventilation or ECMO. Clinical status, so one through eight, one and two are basically not hospitalized, so you could have COVID or not, sorry, you could have COVID um, and you were just not gonna be in the hospital. 
three through seven is that you're hospitalized, but with varying levels of, uh, of, um, of medical needs. So three would be hospitalized without medical needs. So this is a good example would be a patient who is waiting to be discharged to a nursing home, but needs to have a negative test before leaving. Four would be hospitalized with medical needs. So say for instance, needing to get um, help to get out of bed or help eating. Five is hospitalized for minimum oxygen support. So this would be like a nasal cannula. Six is moderate, so that'd be like the non-rebreather which we talked about. Seven is maximum breathing support, so that would be like ventilation or ECMO. And eight is, is passing away. Now, what I want you to focus on is clinical status number five. So that's hospitalized with minimal oxygen support. And what we found is that this specific group, none of the other groups, this specific group, clinical status five, receiving remdesivir or 1.45 times as likely as somebody receiving placebo to recover by day 14. But it's that specific group, nobody else. So if you required invasive ventilation or you came in and were otherwise, you know, or uh, required ECMO, then you, would not then you would not gain any clinical benefit from this drug. What we also found is that this particular group, no other groups, were 0.28 times as likely to die at day 14 and 0.3 times as likely to die by day 29. So this particular group received faster recovery and were less likely to die, but none of the other, none of the other groups. What they also find is that amongst patients who did not die, patients on remdesivir were hospitalized for a shorter duration, so 10 days versus 14 days, so it also reduced duration of hospitalization. And they also required fewer days of oxygen therapy. If patients required high flow oxygen, mechanical ventilation, or ECMO at baseline, clinical status of six or seven, it did not shorten the duration of these interventions. So it didn't help you get off of these, off of the ventilator or off of ECMO. However, one thing we did find is that it was effective in preventing the introduction of these interventions. So if a patient started receiving remdesivir, they're less likely to require mecha mechanical ventilation or ECMO by the end of the trial. One other thing to note, that patients who appear to benefit from this drug had um, less than 10 days of illness. So this kind of goes back to the hypothesis that this is part of, that one of the reasons that this virus is so deadly is that it puts your immune system into overdrive. So patients who were relatively, who did not require um, major interventions, so low flow oxygen, and who were short in their duration of illness, so less than 10 days, appear to do well. Because by this point, you are, the immune system hasn't kicked into overdrive and you're inhibiting viral replication to avoid pushing them over the edge into that overactive immune state. So this looks pretty promising. Unfortunately, another trial did come out and that was the WHO Solidarity trial. Now, we're only gonna be talking about remdesivir, but this particular trial actually did look at quite a few other interventions, including hydroxychloroquine, lopinavir with ritonavir and interferon beta 1A. So for remdesivir, they looked at in hospital mortality and initiation of ventilation and hospitalization duration. And what we found is that there is no mortality benefit to receiving remdesivir. However, one thing to note is that the previous one looked at low flow oxygen versus high flow oxygen, mechanical ventilation and ECMO. They did not actually break the patients apart in those, into, into those little subgroup analyses. So unfortunately, this trial does conflict with the original one in that they found that there's no reduction in the initiation of ventilation or hospitalization duration. but they did not look at the subgroup analysis. So what we are working on right now is that we think that remdesivir may benefit patients who are receiving supplemental oxygen and who are started on treatment if they're symptomatic for less than 10 days. However, because they, we do have two trials which do show slightly different results, one trial did look at it a little bit more detailed than the second trial. The data are not definitive and further studies are needed and we are still currently studying this medication. The next drug we're gonna talk about is tocilizumab. And this is the interleukin-6 um, monoclonal antibody. And what this does is that it, <clears throat> excuse me, kind of stops one of the inflammatory modulators in your body, one of those cytokines, one of the messengers that says, hey guys, there's an infection here, we got issues. It blocks that, blocks that uh, particular cell messenger. 
So we looked at where patients who had um, laboratory confirmed um, infection with SARS-CoV-2 and required ICU support. They would receive tocilizumab 400 milligrams once or an eight milligram per kilo dose with a second possible dose if the patient continued to require oxygen. And they, and they compared those patients against another group of patients who were just receiving the usual care. So this is patients who were just receiving fluids, inhalers, ventilation if they needed it. Primary outcome was in-hospital mortality, and the secondary outcome was oxygen requirements, infections, and the use of medications to support blood pressure. Here's another survival curve, and what we did find is that the confidence interval, once again, CI 0.56 to 0.89 did not cross one, with a p-value of less than 0.0027. And what we did find is that patients were 29% less likely to die by day 100 if they received tocilizumab. There were no differences in between the groups at the patients uh, in terms of oxygen support, medications needed for blood pressure, or bacterial infections. And what we did find is that this may benefit patients who are in ICU setting. However, going back to the levels of evidence, this was not a randomized controlled trial. And so the data are not as robust as the previously discussed studies. That being said, about two weeks ago, uh, another study was actually published, which actually did show that this drug was not effective in reducing mortality. And that one was a little bit more robust than this one. So the data, more robust data is showing that this may not be as effective. Last but not least, we're gonna talk a little bit about hydroxychloroquine. Um, I felt it was important to uh, include this because there was um, um, quite a bit of controversy surrounding this medication. So what we did is we included patients with suspected or laboratory confirmed um, SARS-CoV-2 infection and no contraindications to hydroxychloroquine. So hydroxychloroquine can actually do a couple of different things in your body. And one of it is that it actually prolongs the time needed for your heart to repolarize after a heartbeat. So as long as the patient did not have things like cardiac contraindications, we, wouldn't, um, we would include them in this trial. What we did uh, is that we gave a patient hydroxychloroquine 800 milligrams at hour zero, and then again at hour six, and then 400 milligrams every 12 hours thereafter for a total of, of nine additional days. Primary outcome was all-cause mortality at 28 days. And the secondary outcome was time to discharge from the hospital or death in a patient who did not receive mechanical ventilation. So that would be a patient who comes in in the ER and just needs to be put on a nasal cannula and then is sent to the floor. If you required mechanical ventilation at the, ver at the very beginning, they were not included in this particular analysis. And what we found is that there was no difference in mortality. This picture looks like it got a little distorted, but you can see that the confidence interval is 0.97 to 1.23. So it did cross one and that p-value is greater than 0.05. We did find that patients in the hydroxychloroquine group actually had a longer duration of hospitalization than the usual care group, so 16 days versus 13 days. And amongst patients who were not placed on mechanical ventilation at baseline, which is that group I was just talking about, and those who received hydroxychloroquine were more likely to require mechanical ventilation or die than those who did not. So in that particular group, it appears it actually may have caused harm. So what we found is that hydroxychloroquine did not provide any additional benefit over the standard of care and could possibly harm patients. And after these data were published, many of these studies were stopped. Next one we're gonna talk about is the regen CoV-2. This is actually combined of two separate antibodies. And what we found is that it actually effectively binds and neutralizes the SARS-CoV-2 virus. However, this is in preliminary research. No human trials have actually been published yet. It's currently in phase three trials. Um, we're still waiting for the data to be published, but it looks pretty interesting. This is sort of one of those trials that's currently ongoing right now in, in patients. So just in summary, I'd like to talk about, we talked about all these different treatments. The first one is dexamethasone. It may benefit patients who are on supplemental oxygen. Remdesivir may benefit patients who are early on in their disease course and on oxygen. Tocilizumab may benefit patients who are critically ill with COVID-19. However, a new trial has just been published, which shows that it may not benefit patients. But um, the next one is Regen CoV-2 and uh, shows promise in early studies, but no human trials have been published. And last is hydroxychloroquine and there's no benefit. 
these are my references. Um, many of these are actually published on the New England Journal of Medicine, which um, actually has um, is making all um, COVID studies um, available for free. So you can go onto their website and just download it. And um, yeah, any questions? That was such an amazing presentation. Um, I know there are a lot of people who have a lot of questions to ask. I'm going to try and get to as many of them as we can. Um, I also wanted to start off by asking if there are any questions anyone wants answered on the record. So I know we have members of the media here. I would ask that you please message me those questions um, or Jen any those questions now because we'll try to ask them first and then we do respect our audience members as well as our amazing presenter. The rest of them are off the record. The first question we have for you is from, um, is one question on the record is, can you describe a bit of your experiences as a frontline worker? What is it like? What is it like day to day? Is it tiring? Is it emotional? Can you share a little bit about that? Sure. Um, day to day, I mean, it is, it is, um, it's pretty busy on our wards right now. Um, we, we are getting quite a a uh, few patients uh, who have active uh, corona. I'm sorry. Oh, okay. yeah, who have active coronavirus infections. Um, um, we've had to make a lot of process changes at the at our hospital to sort of deal with the large influx of patients. Um, but I would have to say I would describe it as as uh, difficult and taxing at times. But it's also quite rewarding to try to make a positive impact on these patients. Thank you so much. My apologies. My dog is being very loud in the back here. In the background. Okay. Um, um, the second question that um, uh, we got asked is if you can talk about the response in Salt Lake City in particular, in Utah in general, how does it compare to the rest of the country and what have your experiences been like? Um, we've had a pretty robust response. Um, we've been getting a lot of support from um, from our public health officials and our hospitals are making a lot of changes to, to deal with the large increase of patients. Um, unfortunately, I only work at one hospital, so I can't really speak to the rest of the country um, in, in how our response compares to theirs. Um, so, I mean, we, we are making a lot of changes in trying to, uh, to deal with large influx of patients. Um, I can tell you that my particular hospital, I feel is doing a very good job in, um, in responding to the to the demands placed on it. I personally feel uh, very confident in, in our frontline workers and I'm so grateful that you took the time to come and talk to us today. I have seen the many, many questions we weren't able to get to. Thank you all for asking them. They are wonderful questions, all of them. Thank you so much to Dr. Kyle Mulholder for taking the time today. This has been a truly informative session. Just full of things everyone needs to know as they look to treatments, as they try to figure out what's going on. Just brilliant job. Thank you so much for your time. Thank you all for coming and we hope to see you again next week.